Hey everybody, it's Matt Michaels here on the Vegas Bad Boys Podcasting, and today I am being joined by someone who has a pretty great story, um, an actor, a writer, a producer, um, I would I would assume a grip, a lighting man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mr. Timothy Jones, how you doing, man? I'm good, you're, and you're right, Matt, when you talk about all of the prestigious things and you already know that behind the scenes, they also do everything else. So, yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. There's, there's not a production that you can say that you've either produced or directed or written or been on that, you know, Hey, um, we need this. Can, do you know anyone who could do it? All right. Yeah, I could do it. Matt, I swear on the first film in 2015 that I wrote, produced, and directed, when the credits rolled, I decided to give myself credit. I was the um, hair stylist because I cut the guy's hair. You know, the people that were in the film, I cut their hair as a barber. I gave myself uh, credit for craft services, you know, because I did everything. So yeah. I get it. Yeah, well, there's, you know what, and, and I think that, I think that it's funny because those of us who are in the industry have been around it forever. It's just, you know, it's secondhand. It's, you know, something that happens where other people who just are entertained, just watch things, don't necessarily understand when it's not a big Hollywood budget production. Right. It's you and your car and going to Costco and filling up on those cheese balls and <laughs> come on man cases of water yeah um if if you are fortunate you get ice and you might get some soda but you're definitely going to get water on my side yeah oh man well let me ask you like how did you come about in terms of i i know that uh you did a um a, a documentary right um essentially with discovering destiny um mm -hmm. and i think that the description of it that is out there is is very interesting because of the fact that it's your story of overcoming and i'm going to get this right here childhood abuse drug alcohol addiction gang affiliation womanizing and shoplifting <laughs> did you watch it <laughs> you just read you just read about it this yes. is all the stuff. I, 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 I have to watch it still i haven't been able to get a chance to watch it but just reading all that i first of all i'm ex i got excited to talk to you because i i love these types of stories that go from you know something that is tough and i grew up around a lot of people that if i didn't choose the path i chose I would have been in the same boat. Right. How, how did this affect your life? Where were you growing up? And, you know, what was it that drove you towards these different things that would eventually then lead you onto, you know, reclaiming your life back? That's a great question, Matt. You know, I think it's almost synonymous with what you said about the environment that you lived in and the people. I don't think anybody comes out the womb you know, wanting to ruin their life. But, you know, we are the product of everyone that we're around. So I was born in South Central Los Angeles, which is still a beautiful place. However, there's a lot of poverty. Um, and we moved when I was a child and we moved out into the Inland Empire, but I was always going back and forth because all of my relatives lived in LA. But the point is this, it wasn't so much Los Angeles or a certain geographic location. It was the people that I hung out with. You know, you hear the, uh, the adage uh, association brings on assimilation. And I hung out with a lot of people that really didn't care about their future. So you're, you're rolling the dice with your life. You're taking a lot of risk. Um, you're being very reckless in your decision-making. So to be honest with you, and I'm very different than a lot of people, I don't believe in good people and bad people. These were not bad people. Um, these were people that a lot of them didn't have fathers I did. Um, a lot of them were misled. Um, a lot of them were just making, you know, childhood foolish decisions, but for some, it cost them time in prison. I had a friend that did 20 years for being at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. So my whole point is, yes, during my teenage years, I made a lot of bad decisions, 
um, that could have got me in a lot more trouble than what it, you know, than what happened. But I was very fortunate. And, you know, at 21, I just kind of um, denounced, you know, the decision making that I was making. And I knew that there was something greater for me because I was ruining my life. Uh, you know, and let me ask you, because we're in this same ballpark age wise. Um, at that time, let's say, you know, late middle school, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth grade. Um, was it that same culture that we had in Chicago, which was the starters jackets? Oh, yeah. Forever? where everyone like you couldn't like we just we couldn't wear a starter's jacket because you were going to probably get mugged for the jacket it was right. crazy um and the colors too were another you know a big thing uh, especially because in chicago the bulls and obviously in la you had the uh, the raiders at the time mm -hmm. um and that was fascinating to me too because even in chicago you wore the bulls colors you wore that red you're taking a, a risk of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like you Absolutely. said. And so, I mean, was that, was that, was it tough for you to, to kind of see that the people you were around were kind of making bad choices because of that fact that I, and I know this is what I felt and we did some stupid shit. Um, that, that idea of, these are your friends. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but then, yeah, you know, you got that little laugh afterwards because you realize how, how valuable was that friendship when they were putting me in a bad position or, you know, I was around when they decided to, you know, stick up a grocery store, you know, something like that. And trust me, I was, <laughs> I was in some pretty fucked up situations. Right. Uh, how, how bad was it for you? Was there a chance that you almost got nabbed. Absolutely. And I want to touch on a couple of things that you said. Living in California, which was at the time the hotbed for gang activity. I know that back east we have the Vice Lords and the Disciples, all of that, but I'm talking Crips and Bloods. California, yeah. that's why everybody that wasn't here only viewed California as Boys in the Hood, Minister Society. They didn't know that there was a place called Long Beach or a place, you know, called Newport Beach that wasn't associated with that. However, um, a lot of my friends were gang affiliated. And I love what you said because a lot of people don't think about this. They were my friends. They weren't bad guys trying to influence me to do wrong and beat me up and bully me so that I would ruin my life. They loved me and I love them. But it's almost like the blind leading the blind. Like if you don't have GPS and you're trying to drive from LA to Chicago, you might get lost. And so I had a lot of misled friends. Um, but yes, um, the first time I was arrested was shoplifting. So that was petty. Um, then it was a DUI. So, you know, that was petty. But even then, when you talk about colors, I had on all blue when the officer arrested me. And I'll never forget because he was a middle-aged white man, but I was so impressed with his gang. Uh, he worked in the gang unit. He knew all of the gangs in the area. when. When I'm driving in the back seat, hands behind my back, he says, so you might, are, are you from X, you know, community? No. Are you from this set? No. And I'm sitting back there like, how does this middle-aged white guy know all these sets? He was paid to know. And so yeah. I had to change the way I dressed. You know, when I changed my mindset, living in this culture, you have to change everything. Because like you said, starter jackets can get you in trouble. Shoelaces can get you killed. Um, and I just, you know, now you see, and obviously this is 26 years later and I'm 47, but I think that if someone chooses to change their life, you pretty much have to change everything, uh, even maybe even your zip code, because that's just a part of your identity. Well, you know, that's fascinating too, because there are so many different stories about, um, you know, people who have either gone on to be uh, entertainers in some matter, whether it be, let's say, rappers or or musicians or actors or sports, you know, athletes who time and time again, and, and it's a small percentage out of, you know, the, the thousands of names that happen to go back to the old neighborhood for whatever reason 
and something horrible happens because they went back and you're so true when when you have to change zip codes really to kind of get that fresh start and trying to build your career and what you want to do and that's so you know dangerous of going back to that setting where you still have guys who might be 37 38 now and they are still doing the same lifestyle that they had then and it's it's crazy man yeah um yeah how how uh how important was it for you um to when you started seeing what you wanted to do how important was it for you that you had uh your mom there uh you know kind of being that good mom voice and and eventually that mom in the back of your head that kind of every time you don't really want that to kick in you hear that little voice you're like damn it shit fuck you're right you're right I <laughs> how, how important was it for that type of support and i know your mom did pass away um yeah. a, a few years ago um is that something that is is also still with you to this day yeah good question matt um one um her voice was the voice of reason um throughout my entire childhood i mean and, and i hope i'm not out of school by saying this but maybe other people can relate my mom used to get on my last nerve because she, but everything she said was to help me. Um, but when you are going left and someone is constantly preaching right, um, it can it can be overwhelming. But I love what you said, even after she passed and today is her birthday, um, it resounds in my head. I can still hear her, you know, speaking to me. I can still, you know, not obviously literally, but I can still hear all of the moral compass teaching instructions, you know, don't go there. Why are you hanging out with them? Um, I don't think you should do this. You know, you feel that compass on the inside of you. So it was, it was critical. I don't know where my life would be if she wasn't so nagging, so to speak, with, with, with such a hard headed kid. It's hard for a woman to um, have significant influence over a man. Um, but she, she was a tough broad. She was born in Detroit. Um, she was born in the ghetto. She left there when, you know, her parents left when she was little, she moved to Los Angeles, another ghetto. There was 14 of them. And Uh then when her parents divorced, her mother had to raise 14 kids. She was one of the oldest. So she told us as she got older, she didn't really have a childhood because she was raising kids her whole life. Um, I say that because she was so tough. I mean, the first time that she got in my face, I think I was around seven or eight. And I thought she was just the sweetest, nicest, prettiest woman I had ever met. And the truth is, one day she said something, and my dad was at work, obviously. Um, She said something to me, and I turned around and I said, bitch, under my breath. And she said, what did you say? And I said, I didn't, she had bionic ears because I didn't think she heard me. I was walking away. And I said, huh, huh, huh. You know, I didn't say anything. And she turned around and she grabbed me by my shirt. I'll never forget the sweetest, prettiest, nicest, angelic woman grabbed me by the shirt and pulled me close to her. And she said, I'm from Detroit. Don't you ever. And like, I ne- I was like, I was shocked. And I, I, you know, from that day forward, I had respect. Yeah, yeah that's it's it's amazing too when we when we look back and we see those moments as we were as kids and it's those realization moments where you're like oh okay there there's more to this than there's layers <laughs> yeah it's like um well you know and and i you used a great word there layers Have you been able, when you, you know, find a role, write something, um, you know, get uh, even in in documentaries as well, do you find that it's easier to find or build upon the layers of the characters being presented? Give it to me one more time, Matt. I think I know where you're going. Yeah, yeah. So... 
you know, like you said, we, uh, I mean, we all have layers as people. And I think what right. happens a lot of times with actors um, who don't necessarily understand the fact that what we're doing is we're finding those different layers to characters, even if yeah. it's the simplest thing written on a page, you know, you know, where's my dinner? Well, where's my dinner could have so much different impact. Sure. So are you able to bring those different um, layers to either what you write or what you're doing on set as an actor to bring that dimension, um, that life to it that mm -hmm. some actors aren't able to do? Yeah, great question, Matt. Um, I'll be honest with you. I love, I, I told someone this today, I had an audition this morning and I told the casting director, my greatest strength is the fact that I'm a theatrically trained actor. I, you know, the majority of the training that I have was in theater. So we were taught, uh, the discipline that we received was to tap into the character, respect the character. If I'm playing Matt, I need to know what he eats, what motivates him, what's his biggest weakness, uh, what is he afraid of? Um, you know, what are his, you know, red button items? And, you know, you have to peel back, like you said, it's almost like Shrek when uh, the donkey said, you know, you know what, Shrek, you're like an onion. And, you know, and Shrek was not feeling him at the time. He had just met him. And I know all the kids' movies because I got kids. And he says later in the movie, he realized it was a compliment. And, and Eddie Murphy's character said, you know, you just peel back the onion and you got so many different layers and you, you're so complex. And Shrek understood it. So yes, I'm trained. I cannot look at a script and read lines. I have to become that person. And in order to do that, I have to respect that character and I have to identify all of those layers of that person's personality, their uh, life experiences, their education, um, their flaws, their strengths, um, and their greatest fears. And that's, that's the passion for me when it comes to acting, is really tapping into that. So I'll, I'll, now we get into advanced acting class here, which this is what I, I love when you know we're able to talk like this. So let me ask you: you get something, you know, aside, you know, two pages. You know, you're going in for an audition. You're reading the side, and it calls for someone who looks like you, right? But when you get the side and you're reading through it, you're like okay i have no I, I like i've never been a uh you know a stock trader on, on wall street right are you able then to look at when you're when you're reading you're finding out the process of who this person is relating to yourself are you mm -hmm. able to find that thread so that you can bring something to this character even though you might not have had the shared experience of what the exterior is, you find something in the interior, then all of a sudden, boom, you bring that into the door, casting director sees it and is like, oh, shit, I've never thought of it this way. That's right. Okay, let's cast this guy. Is, is that something that you look for in, in terms of when you find something that you don't necessarily re relate to? that you're able to find something so you can bring something to that. So when you walk in the door, you know that when you walk out, you've done your damnedest best. Absolutely. Let me tell you uh, something funny. Well, the first thing I'll tell you is three things that I look for. One is how can I relate to that character? Do I have anything in common with him? And to your point, let's just use the stockbroker analogy. Do I know any stockbrokers? Because I was never one. And then I try to tap into that person that I know because they're my intimate friend. And then if I don't know anyone else, then I just have to do the research. And once I do the research, um, that will help me to be able to identify with that character. I'll tell you something funny, and it's one of the clips that I sent you. I don't know if you had a chance to watch it, but uh, I played a pimp in Barry Brewer's uh, upcoming comedy sitcom, um, Jack and Jill. I've never been a pimp, per se, um, but I, you know, some of my uncles were pimpish. And, and then I did know some younger guys that really were pimps. So I love the fact that I'm not limited to my own life experience. I have a lot of life experience, but I've never been a pimp, just like I've never been a doctor or a pilot. But um, once I tapped into the characteristics 
of this guy, the backstory. I actually made him from my same childhood neighborhood. So when I, you know, when I delivered it, you know what I'm saying? I still kept that same South Central flavor. You feel me? I still, I'm able to embody the, the geographic location he's from, maybe even his education or the lack thereof. Um, and then, you know, I start identifying with where did the womanizing come from? A lot of the guys that I'm not trying to get deep, but a lot of pimps and people that, you know, abuse women or are, um, you know, um, uh, what's the word, Matt, when you, you know, um, they, they say in music videos, the, they're doing what to women? Um, um, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Like, like a woman emasculates a man, but it's been a man. Um, a misogynistic. Uh, misogynistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of the guys that are misogynistic, they've actually either been abused or they've had some sort of bad experience with women. So now they are punishing all the women. Once I can do that type of research and identify one of my friends that went to prison or another friend that got into this, why did they do that? Once you can tap into the why, it really doesn't matter if I've really had that life experience. I can actually tap into it because everything that I've done has been motivated by something. You know, I'm glad you brought up that because I did, I did watch that, uh, that episode. Um, and one of the things that, well, first, let me ask you, um, did you have a grill in? No, I didn't. I just had a toothpick. A tooth I thought about put when I prepare, that's a funny question, Matt, when I was preparing, cause you know, Barry gave me Liberty once they cast me, I was at home, you know, we're in the mirror. I'm trying grills. I'm trying this, I'm trying that. And I'm trying different lingo. And once I got to make the final decision, I said, nah, he's from Cali. People in Cali don't really, we don't wear grills. That's a Southern yeah. thing. That's a New York, you know what I'm saying? That's New York. Yeah. But so I made the decision not to, but good question. No, and the, and the reason I asked is because you had this subtle move and, and I just couldn't tell because I was looking at it on my phone. So I couldn't tell on the screen because you did this little subtle thing almost right before you exited with the... <laughs> go into the mouth and it was like dude that i mean it was a subtlety it was it was something so small yeah. that it was it was just to me it was it was part of the character what i loved about it was what you presented and um what the uh the actress with you presented uh the the uh, the lady of the night <laughs> your your lady of the yeah. night <laughs> <laughs> um it was beautiful to watch the interaction with the character of Jill and, and Jill being a main character because you guys were giving, it was like watching play and catch. Yeah. You guys were just given nice little things. The, the, when you see the moment that it hits her, that you're a pimp and it was beautiful because the choices that you made it wasn't obvious that, oh, he's playing a pimp. Exactly. And it, it just was, it was fucking fun to watch because it was just like, you know, um, you know who, and, and your style reminded me a lot of uh, uh, D.B. Smoove, you know, the, who did Curb Your Enthusiasm, all this other comedy. Yes, stuff. yes, yes. Because it, it you, you just played it so subtly, but it was amped up to that, nice portion where it still was comedy and damn man it was it was some good shit and i think that that to me excites me when i watch something and i go there's something about that performance as small of a time frame as it is you know i think it was about two and a half minutes three minutes that you know yeah. you guys were and it's like i kind of even though i like the rest of the episode that at the beginning to me yes. so was like, yeah and i wanted more you know it's like oh man i want to know well, a little Matt, bit more let me say something i love your eye i i sent that uh, to an executive producer in hollywood who's a very close friend of mine just to get like her honest feedback about it she said the exact same thing that you did she said uh, she's panamanian she said Timoteo, i like that you played the pimp so subtle she said it wasn't over the top. It wasn't 70s black exploitation. Look here, baby. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the moon if you fly with me. It wasn't all of that. It, it was, 
you're standing next to the guy at the Piggly Wiggly and you just don't know he's a pimp. You know, he's just got a woman with him. Now, Vegas, I mean, I was there, I don't know, let's just say six months ago. Notorious. When you see a guy walking with a couple of girls, he doesn't have a long, you know, hat on with a feather in it. He doesn't necessarily have a gold chain with a dollar sign like I did. Yeah. Um, but if you watch the interaction between him and multiple women, you're like, oh, that's a pimp. Because that's not his girlfriend. He's dealing with them all. It's a business. I wanted to play it in such a way that, one, he was just like, um, you know, intruding because she only asked for a female roommate to come. Uh, so he, there was no reason for him to be there. So I just wanted to be a little intrusive. And then I wanted to let on a little bit that, you know, she could have been my bottom. And you have to be from the street to understand that lingo. And so by the time she left, and I love what you said, the epiphany is when the door closed and she's like, that was, light bulb went off. I didn't want to come in the house and announce that I was, you know, you should be yeah. able to, if you're an actor, you should be able to tell that story subtly. And what, and to, to layer this on, um, and, and one of the things that I thought was, again, a really just nice move was when you pull out this wad of bills together, right? It, it's a brick of money. And it was just, it was just so second nature because it wasn't like, hey, look at my money or what. It was just like, well, here, here's, here's the cash. I don't understand why we can't just go in and have our room. Which pretty much only <laughs> someone from the street would do. <laughs> no, it was yeah, I, you know, and that's what it, again it excites me because it's fun to see the process, and you know how much time you put into it as an actor, and I think that also is something I don't think a lot of people realize is it's not just hey show up do it go home you're done you you really are investing some time into your thought mm. process of. What am I doing? What am I exploring? And that's the other thing. You get a chance to, before you even walk onto a set, you get a chance to do some of the worst acting in your life in front of that mirror. <laughs> you're just Absolutely. Like, you're literally just whipping stuff against the wall to see what is going to stick, what's going to hit. And yeah. I think that, yeah, if, if we had a camera for those of us who are actors, that we just turn on just so you can record that process of where it goes from over the top or very, very subtle to oh. find that right, you know, that right balance. It's yeah. that I, whew. Um, so we talked a little bit about that, but the, um, the big, you know, news is you do have a film called swim um, that's on Tubi. Um, and it's what caught my attention right away was the fact that it's from the uh, executive producer of Sharknado. Ah, oh, you picked that up, bro. You are so sharp. Well, you know what? Here's the thing. I am like a huge. <laughs> I thought those were so. Man, <laughs> man I, I'm sorry to cut you off, man. I didn't even know. So please don't be mad at me. I didn't even know. Uh, that Sharknado was such a phenomenon, bro, because it's not necessarily something that my kids would have said, hey, dad, you know, they were, when they were younger, it was like, I'm scared of sharks. So I always had to take them to see Shrek or High School Musical right. and all the yeah. cheesy children's movies. When the writer um, of Sharknado, who also wrote Swim, when I was on set with him and he was kind of giving us a tutorial of the backstory of Sharknado and the, the portfolio of part one and part two and part three i was just fascinated like wow i didn't even know this that they have such a cult following yeah in fact um they actually it, in vegas there still are some sharknado slot machines around wow yeah and it's it's amazing huge these huge graphics you know all this great stuff um and it, what's interesting about it too is that when you come up with a simple concept like hey, tornadoes with sharks, you kind of go, okay, we can get this made. There's something there. There's a market for it. I think what was unexpected was the fact that kind of what you said, well, the kids aren't into the sharks, but yet 
they're afraid of them. So mm. therefore, it kind of draws in that, well, hey, let me check this out, man. I'm kind of, I'm afraid of sharks, but, and then you see this and you're like, dude, that actually was pretty fucking cool. But I love <laughs> this premise now of, you know, just having this, um, this environment in which it's almost like, you know, you, you have to sw swim or be killed essentially. Yeah. Um, what, what was, what was it for you going into this? Did you, did you have to, you know, do anything in terms of, um, you know, was there any physical demands on you? Was what, what was the preparation for this like for you? Matt, when we first, when I was cast for Swim, which was directed by Jared Cohn, who's done a whole bunch of stuff, um, and he just finished directing Bruce Willis and um, uh, William Shatner, and he's just a really very good, accomplished director. When he cast me in this, um, and we had the first read through, he sat in with all the actors on Zoom and we read through it. The first thing that caught my eye, to be honest with you, Matt, was the story. Um, the shark was the star, and it, but it wasn't this vicious, I don't want to give the story away at all, and I won't, um, it wasn't this over-the-top, you know, it was like Jaws, um, right. and, and, and right. here's the similarities, Jaws had a great storyline, and I mean, I know you're a fan, so you know the backstory of how the fish wasn't even working, you know, the prop, you know, it, it was just a mess, and, but the movie still came out very good because of the way that it was written. Um, the way that this film was written by Anthony, um, I believe that when I first read it, you know, and they asked us for our feedback at the end of the call, everyone kind of gave their feedback and their excitement. I told Jared, I said, dude, this is very well written. So my preparation, um, and I can't go into a lot of detail. I played the handyman. Um, the, the, the movie stars Joey Lawrence from, you know, Give Me a Break, Fame, Blossom. Whoa. Um, he's the star. <laughs> And him and his family are coming from the East Coast to their vacation property in Malibu. I'm the handyman for the property. And, you know, by the time they get here, this huge, unexpected California storm, you know, breaks out and, you know, hence the shark and the introduction and the rest, you know, is beautiful. But for me, once I read through the story and I saw kind of like the experiences that my character was going to have, I had to really tap into um, the pain of most men and most actors, most actors, to be honest with you, and I'm having fun with this because I got a bunch of actor friends, but everybody wants to roll where you can be sexy and you want to take your shirt off and you, you know, you want to sip your, you know, water and kind of like lick your lips and, you know, you want to be the star and I'm being facetious, but when it comes to like, you know, someone playing the role where they're dying of cancer or, um, you know, they are assaulted or maybe they even have to play the, the predator um, like Charlie Theron in Monster. That girl killed that role, that true story of the prostitute who was a serial killer, but there was a reason why. And Charlize changed her skin and she was doing all this hillbilly movement. And I was sitting there like, I was, when the movie went off, Matt, I just, I couldn't move. I was like, yeah. what just happened? Because she wasn't sexy anymore. She was powerful. And yeah. so when I read about my character, I'll never forget the greatest compliment. And I'll wrap this up. The greatest compliment I received on set was when one of the actresses went into uh, her trailer and it was time for my scene. And I had an interaction with the shark. I'll just say that. And she was laying down, taking a nap. And she said she started crying. Um, and she said, I never heard a man cry like that. She said, in her whole life, she said, I've never, you know, she, you know how men say, I haven't cried in seven years. Let a shark <laughs> bite you, you know, uh, you know, so I'll just go into, that's all I'll say is that yeah. when she heard me, I wanted to give like, I, I'm in several scenes, but in, in that particular scene, I wanted to be honest. We're not tough guys. If drop me and you off in Africa and we got to go fight a lion, we're going to die and we're not going to be, they're not going to say, uh Oh, that's Matt. They're not afraid of anything. And like, there's no crips in, in, in Zimbabwe, you know, that are out there gang banging with lions. 
There's no gangster disciples. And your little 22 or your nine millimeter, you don't stand a chance against seven lions. You're going to die. And yeah. you're going to cry like any other man. So um, I wanted to be honest. Yeah, I love that um, description because I think that one of the things that we tended to do as, um, I guess as a society, but definitely Hollywood in a sense, when you started getting, so let's take Psycho. Psycho was, a, you know, 1963, it's a jumping point because there's never been anything like that before that really showed the mind of a serial killer, right? And then you fast forward as psychological stuff is still being done, all of a sudden then we get to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now we're seeing something a little different. There's psychological stuff, but we're seeing more of the psychology coming off from the victims, mm. the actual you know, killers, because in that case, Leatherface doesn't talk. We get to Mike Myers in Halloween, doesn't talk. We get to Jason, doesn't talk. And then Freddy Krueger comes around and changes the whole perspective again, how we look. <laughs> exactly. So when, when you're talking about then that realization of, you know, usually it's, it's always been a very overdramatic kill is what they mm. base things on. But when you're starting to deal, and I think this is why Jaws really did come off well, and that was you connect with the characters and your choice of investing real emotion into this, where another actor might have just, you know, I'm getting eaten by a shark, you know, woe is me, ow, ow, ow. <laughs> the thing is, is that if that happens, you don't care that he just got eaten by a shark. But I can guarantee you, your performance, because you added that realism, is now going to mean that everyone watching is invested. And that's pivotal because now you're more concerned about seeing main characters make it through. Yes. And I, it totally gets lost a lot of times in wow. her films. Dude, when you say that, man, my agent's wife, I, I asked them, I said, I want you guys just for fun. I said, I want you guys to give me play-by-play -play, um, reaction throughout the movie. I didn't think they would do the whole movie. I'm talking about for an hour and a half. They, they, they created a group chat and they text me every three minutes, minimum. And I was just laughing, ha, 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 happy face, happy face, shark, shark, shark. Um, but you... I'm only saying that because Matt, you're so right. My agent's wife, Christy, she said to me, and, and I, again, I'm trying so hard not to give anything away. She said, Tim, um, I felt that, that, that scene. And she said, I hate it. She said, I didn't want to watch any more of the movie after that. But then they did, you know, they say that and then they continued to watch. But right. then they were rooting for everyone else because you don't want to see Matt have that same experience that Timothy did. So you're right. You gotta, I hate to use this word, you gotta sell it. You have to be honest. I prefer honesty over sale because then it just sounds like a hustle. You have to be honest. How would I really feel right now if a snake bit me on the leg? I wouldn't say like, oh, hey, hold on, Matt, I need to take a five, take five. No, bro, that's pain. And we yeah. would react. And I heard Denzel Washington say years ago, Acting is reacting. Yeah, yeah. I um, one of uh, one of my um, I was lucky enough to study with uh, Jason Alexander from Seinfeld, mm -hmm. and one of the uh, the keys to um, what you've been talking about, what I've been talking about, what Jason talked about in his class, is the fact that we're all stage actor background, and isn't it funny that. The whole idea of, um, you know, like you just said, reaction. Well, to get a reaction, I have to give you something so that you can give me something back. It's, it, I mean, yeah. we were really just throwing this ball of energy to each other. And what happens is that we as, as stage actors, 
we tend to be a little bit bigger because on stage you have to play to a you know a 300 seat auditorium 500 seat auditorium whatever it is but there is a sense of honesty that i think some film actors can't even get that is very simple because all we do is we just tone down the actual the largeness and we go from being like this to being like this mm. you know and a little more focused so we bring that reality that that truth that we learn um because that's another word that you know a lot of my uh people that i've studied under is you know um for instance truth and comedy is huge mm. you know you can't be um you can't be a comedian you can't be a comedic actor without having a strain of truth what are our favorite stand-up comics the ones who are so good are the ones who point out the truths whether it be observation <laughs> or right and i think on top of that too it's that pain a lot of times in the truth of the matter that makes us empathize and makes the situation two things that are key for oh. any type of entertainment and that is uncomfortability and relatability if you can hit that and you're you know it just makes it so entertaining and as an audience member we don't even think about that right we're watching this yeah. and like it and but then when you hit something that gets when you start moving someone and whether it be a belly laugh or whether it be to tears a little bit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I love the the um that people continue for this past decade to talk about the beginning of the movie up and you of course being a dad probably saw up enough times classic. classic but you put on that first five minutes and why is that the thing ever out of everything else that's what everyone remembers because Pixar did something and never even really considered, you know, in all their films, even though they had great relatable tie-ins, it was the first one that really made us feel something about losing the only person in our lives that we had as our friend and then becoming an isolated old grumpy person because of that. Mm. And it pulls your strings because it's so relatable and it's so uncomfortable to watch, even though it's so beautiful to watch. And I think mm. that's, yeah, you know, isn't it? It's just so fun that we can do things as performers that can admit those, you know, take those emotions and put them out there for people who, you know, maybe you just never, you know, you, you said it early on guys don't cry guys don't cry you tell me that nine out of ten guys sitting in a theater watching the movie up did not shed a tear during that come on minutes, no but, but let me say something that I, I just made a friend through you bro i love your perspective and i'm not joking when i say that if you really understand comedy um i'd say i say all the time the funniest comedians are the honest comedians not necessarily to have a silly voice or, hey, did you hear the one about the rabbit? It's, it's not a bunch of silly jokes. It is like, I'll, I'll use Kevin Hart as an example. When he actually named his tour, Laugh at My Pain. I mean, this guy talked about infidelity. He talked about being bullied as a kid. He talked about his dad being a crackhead. Like, those are the things you grew up when I did, because we're about the same age. We called it bagging on kids. If I saw you come out of your house, and you said something about my shoes, I would be waiting. Okay, okay, my turn, my turn. Your mama's so ugly, and we yeah. would bag yeah. on each other. Well, he did a whole comedy special bagging on himself, bro. That's funny. The truth is funny. When you look at Jack and Jill, I wasn't trying to be funny. So my character is the straight guy. Barry Brewer, who wrote the, the show, he's funny. When he comes out and he's like, oh, I'm your roommate? Oh, man, oh, hi, 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 <laughs> He's fun. He's, he's a comedian. Yeah. But, but there's straight guys in comedy, too, when you have Abbott and Costello, Lucy and Ethel, um, some of the funniest people, like Fred Mertz. Um, yeah. it, they, they're very serious, and they get the laugh from being 100%. 
I played that very, very, very serious. That pimp, he was really modeled after a friend of mine. And I did my best to pay homage to my friend. And and he kind of laughed because he's a pimp and he's trying to, trying to hustle. So he said, one of his lines is when she said, oh, I just wanted one roommate. He says, well, I pay all the bills. So it's going to be our room. And he's like, <laughs> And he's kind of looking at her like this guys in the street are like, it's always a hustle. It's right. always, you know, right. it's always a game. I can't trust you. It's a con. So that was the only time he even cracked a pseudo laugh. Other than that, he's 100% serious. You need the money, right? Where's your debit card at, Roscoe? He doesn't have one. You know what I'm saying? He has $10,000 in his pocket. It's not funny to him. It's his everyday yeah. life. Yeah. And so it's- some of the funniest comedians... Seinfeld is just like, hey, so what if you just would have like they're not trying to be funny. They're being they're being honest. Yeah. Um, even down to you know your your exit line about Jill being a bottom. (laughs) It is so conversational. You know, it's it's not you didn't a lot of actors would have put the um the top on it you know and it was like it it was literally you're turning and kind of just it's that last thought of "Eh, you would have been a good third you know (laughs) it's like and and that gave her something to play with because as she closes the door you know it's like yeah it's just that that yeah it's just there's so much to process and then to your point about him barry takes it to you know, that energy of, you know, she's now given her the energy of, I can't believe that I just, you know, fell for this on this fucking app that's supposed to, you know, give us legit shit. <laughs> and Barry is all about the, uh, what kind of friends do you be having over here at the house? Yeah. You know, they're killers and murderers on that website. They just, <laughs> like, he's coming from a comedic standpoint of like, you know, when you go on that site, these are all serial killers. <laughs> and and the and the caveat the, the best part of it is that he refers to it as his house because she just said he's the new roommate <laughs> so it's not even like you know there's no discussion about the room right in his mind it's like what kind of people are you letting into our place come on you know? <laughs> i was just so it's just so real and you know and that's what i love i love when i you know i can see someone um you know just presenting multiple layers by just being honest with it and the other thing too that that is really i think important and especially with your presence you have a a bigger presence your eyes really hone in and I, i know this is something that you know people might have heard over the years about you know acting a lot of it is done with the eyes and one of the reasons being obviously cameras one thing it it picks up things but another part of it is that we can simply as actors look at our scene partners and just give them so much just by what they're seeing if you if you work with an actor in a scene and you and you see that actor doing you know a lot of this or a lot of that or a lot of and avoiding like hey yeah bro bro you know that's where it's like and and i'll play with that as an actor right i'll rehearse a lot i'll i will do some of the worst shit possible some horrible horrible acting why because i want to feel that energy of making the other guy nervous at first you know mm-hmm. kind of getting them because i don't want to give away you know as we're rehearsing and stuff i want to play a little bit i don't want to give away i don't want to choreograph yet then as it starts to become serious now okay we're going to do a final run through and then we'll all of a sudden you lock in and now it's like okay all right now we're feeling it you know and especially as a stage actor you get yeah three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, sometimes of a process of yeah, preparation. 
yeah throwing out your your baggage and shit and it's just it's so cool to watch uh you know a performer like yourself just hit things that you know it's it's like oh he did his homework this is not just a you know a walk-on part or you know um one of the guys who i think george clooney if you watch clooney when he was on like a golden girls or on facts of life or whatever it's really interesting because even at that age at the young age at these small parts and stuff there was something about what he was presenting that felt so much more real mm-hmm. to that situation in comedy you know it was like yeah. oh yeah he's oh he's a nice guy man you know you started seeing things in this guy and then he gets his chance to do drama out of nowhere and he does it for whatever it was 11 years 12 you know yeah what a what a what a way to you know to get a chance to explore and then to get into something where you can have a nice long career and become one of the more you know trusted faces in acting because of the fact that you can look back and, you know, Leo DiCaprio, another guy, you know, oh, you one of the greats. Yeah. You watch him as a kid and it's like, you would have never thought on growing pains. Oh shit. That kid's going to be, you know, because everyone was focused on Kirk Cameron. Yeah. And, and it's really odd to see how, you know, what you would think his trajectory would have been went totally different. And Leo's went the way you thought that Kurtz would go. So yeah. it's, it, it's fun to watch and it's fun to see. And I know I'm babbling on, but I love talking process. Before um, you ask your next question, I do yeah. want to say this about acting because I'm loving this conversation. One thing that I noticed, Matt, being an actor is, and this may be a small percentage, but I see some, especially younger people that are coming into it. Um, you know, it's, it's very critical that us older actors, if they will allow us to sharpen them and um, and teach them about the true value and purpose of acting and preparation. And here's what I mean. I see some younger people come in and they want to be sexy and they want to be the lead and they want to be, there are some who, you know, want to be a star. And, and here's the point. Um, I came up in theater and, and so I'm kind of biased. In theater, we're taught if you are cast to play the pimp, be the best pimp that's ever been seen. If you're Samuel L. Jackson and you're cast to play a crackhead in Jungle Fever, and he used to be addicted to crack. He wasn't the star. It's not sexy to suck on a glass pipe um, and throw your life away. But in the scenes that he was in, he showed, he demonstrated the angst and the desperation and the, the filth um, of someone who is addicted. And I, I really wish if there's any young people watching this that wanna be actors, by all means take acting classes, that's valuable. And I strongly recommend that they, they do some theater, even if it's community theater, even if it's not paid, it's not about that, it's about the training, it's about the development. Because for me, I can honestly say, regardless of when anybody else says to me, I didn't set out to be a star. Um, you know whose career I really like? Now I like a lot of careers, so I'm only going to use one actor because my favorite actor is Denzel Washington and he is larger than life. Right. So I'm not going to use him in that analogy. To me, he's with Tom Hanks, um, Meryl, Meryl Streep. Um, he's in a whole different class. But you know who is like, I think should be the poster child is Jeffrey Wright. Uh, you see him in 007. You've seen him play peoples and um shaft when he's a puerto rican hey you do no 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 like like are you serious like i want to play an african from the homeland in ghana with my brothers and my sisters i i want to play everything i'm i'm not you can't put me in a box when they say well do you want to be a comedic actor or dramatic i do it all i'm theatrically trained we were trained that if it's time to do a comedy let's do it and if it's time to do drama you better cry. The directors would get in your face. You got three minutes to cry. <laughs> Action. Like, I'm trained, bro. There's trained yeah. and there's untrained. I don't, I'm not out to be famous. I'm out to be effective. 
you know, and I think in in that sense, and I, this is something that I don't think actors, you know, especially younger actors, and, and maybe even some actors who maybe have done some stuff, maybe have done, you know, uh, you know, some some B movie stuff or, or whatever. One of the things that I think gets lost is that every single role in a in a production, you know, whether it be TV, whether it be film, whether it be stage. That character is the star of their own life. Think about your life. I'm not going around thinking about that guy's life and that guy's life, all the people that I'm crossing paths with, even your closest friends. You might know some things that they're dealing with, but you're more so thinking about your own perspective on yeah. what's going on. So I think what starts to happen is, is that when actors are given um, the chance and opportunity to do smaller, you know, parts, mm -hmm. two pages, three pages, you know, five scenes, Good. right? They forget that when they're walking into a situation, it's not just what's written down here, but it's you do realize that you've got a wife and three kids and you're a carpenter and you know you're walking into this situation but you have that background already with you you mm -hmm. you know that at the end of the day at 7 p.m you are always going back home and the first thing you do is you sit down and you want to relax but little johnny's jumping onto your lap and stuff and it just you, you know how that as a person you you always carry something with you into a situation right. And sometimes that's why we snap, right? Or sometimes that's why we have to laugh so much is because oh, there's so much going on that it just feels good to be around someone <laughs> who's funny. And so, so there's so much more to that idea of I'm just a bit part. I'm just a, a you oh, know, yeah. When, yeah. When, I, when I learned, when I realized that as a character actor, I might not be the lead, the face of the thing, but if I if I can have people talking about me or or you know telling me you know oh my god this thing, and you've only you were only in it for three minutes, you hit it. You hit Authenticity, it. Matt, and I know we're kind of like we probably lost the audience. They probably went to go make their salad. <laughs> now it's me and you. Dude, I got to say one more thing, I swear to God, and then you can yeah. go in a different direction. Did you ever see uh, Chadwick Boseman in Get On Up when he played um, James Brown? James Brown, yeah. Okay, watch this. Matt, I love the movie. I love Chadwick. He's legendary. His work was unforgettable. It'll go down in the history books forever. You know who I believe stole the show in Get On Up? was the kid, he was a Disney kid. Um, he played Little Richard. He was oh. only in about three scenes. Yeah. But, but but to your point, in those three scenes, he became Little Richard. Yeah. His mannerisms, the, he, locked, he made Chadwick better because I've been, you know, we've gone toe to toe with some good actors. They make you better. Yep. Um, my fiance, she read with me for um, the swim audition because I, I I have to find readers whenever I can and people are at work. So is Matt available? Is is Ronnie, Bobby, Ricky, or Mike? Is somebody available? So my girl read with me for swim, and I was all ready. And you know, I, it's I'm the janitor, or excuse me, the handyman, and you know, pipes are bursting. So I did about a hundred push-ups and I sprayed baby oil all over me, and I was trying to be the sexy handyman. And I came in like ready to do the audition. And then she started reading and she read it like she wanted to get an Oscar. And I said, hey, 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 hold up. Let's start over again. I had to regroup because when people come at you with, you know, their A game, you can't be playing around. That guy that played Little Richard, he knew he was only in three scenes. And he came in there like he meant business. And, and I don't want to say right now what some of the people have been saying to me after they've seen the movie Swim on Tubi, which I encourage everybody to go to Tubi. It's a free app and watch Swim starring Joy, Joy Lawrence. I've had multiple people send me messages, not just to be nice, 
my friends are honest with me. My mentors are honest with me. Um, and, and, and some of the, the essence of what they've been saying is in my four scenes, um, they recognized the authenticity, the seriousness, the passion. I never looked at it like, oh, I'm only in four scenes. What, what's my call time? I'm only working a week. No, I didn't look at it like that. What's my first day? What, what needs to happen that day? And I got to come ready. Like yeah. I am, when I walked on the set of Barry Brewer's Jack and Jill, I don't want to say what I said, um, but I went in the back and they shot a bunch of scenes all day and they called me and said, hey man, we're sorry, it's, it's your turn. I was in the back as Timothy and I was just talking to people and they said, all right, it's time. And now I'm turning into um, Leroy. So yeah. I put the hat on sideways. I put the gold, the toothpick in, I put the medallion and when I walked into the room with the crew, they hadn't started shooting yet. Somebody was in my way. I said, move, fool. And they were like, uh-oh, he's ready. They said, everybody, get on set, get on set, get on set. And I never broke character the whole time. And every time we did it, I did it differently. And Barry recognized my theatrical background. He said, Tim, whatever you want to do from now on, like every scene, just do it. They said, action. And those are the best directors because That's Eddie Murphy on life, um, I think it's Taylor Hackford. I'm not sure who directed um, Life, but the young man who did it, it wasn't Taylor Hackford. Um, he kept telling Bernie Mac, hey, no, 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 don't, you're, you're being too loud. Hey, um, Martin, don't do that. That's not in the script. And Eddie pulled him to the side and said, these guys are comedians. Leave them alone. Let them be them, and they're going to make this movie special. So just say action and get out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, that's... You know, uh, it's it's so funny because, and again, you know, what is really interesting about even that is that it's funny sometimes that directors or producers will try to do something that is, you know, a little too much in terms of being in a controlling presence where they really don't need to. You don't have to show us you're a director, man. Just just tell me like, okay, I need to hit this. I need to hit that. Great. Cool. Let's do it. And we will listen. Yeah. Oh, and then, and then let them go. Let a stallion be a stallion. Don't tell a lion not to roar. He's like, well, what do I, what am I supposed to do then? I'm the freaking king of the jungle. <laughs> what am I supposed to say? Meow. You know? Right. Because then it, what it becomes then is it becomes dictation, you know? Oh, the director hears it in his head like this. This is the only way he hears it. So therefore, he keeps telling you, I want you to say it like this. And it's like, <laughs> but that's not. <laughs> and it's like sometimes and sometimes you just have to like swallow it and go, OK, all right, yeah. I see it. You know, and, and because, again, that's the other thing that's fascinating is there's so many ego you know, involvements in, in the process, it's the best people are the people who put away the ego and put on the collaborative, you know, yeah. let's go um, for the best work. Yeah. It's it, my, my, again, if you go back and you watch the little rascals boy, for a bunch of poor kids in, you know, the depression boy with a, you know, a, a shed and some wood and some gas some cloth they could put it on a show that was like mind-blowing you know that's a perfect example and they probably didn't have craft services they had some crackers and sausage and some kool-aid and they were like okay alfalfa and action, action. And these guys were beast yeah. yeah so um really quick as we uh as we kind of wrap up here because like you said we've probably uh got people now going into their uh, second dinner um you're engaged to be married in January. Yeah. Have you encountered anything? Because I, I have a friend who's getting married now in October. And we were supposed to get, you know, everything was supposed to go down last October, which, uh, or last, God, it, no, April. So April 2020, it was like, everything was like, as soon as the pandemic hit, it just yeah. killed everything. Um, Do you guys encounter anything like that in the process? And how has it been for you, speaking of directors and working with people, has it been her essentially production and you just being that supportive 
you know that sounds good yeah yeah honey oh that's that's good i love it <laughs> great question you know what i'm going to say something funny when it came to the pandemic last year obviously it was bad um, in terms of covid and deaths and all of the serious things but some of the positive things that came out of it is that like now we're on zoom you and i um, yeah. a lot of my auditions 99 percent of them have been self-tapes um, business meetings, you don't have to fly there anymore. There's been a lot of good that has come out of it. Content overload, movie theaters at the time, and I, you know, I'm not celebrating this at all, but I am celebrating uh, creativity. When theaters closed for a moment, it was like you could hear crickets. And then the streaming services blew up. So my point is, yes, last year I was watching people get married and there was four people there. And they were like, hey, pandemic, mask, we're just gonna do the preacher, the witness, the maid of honor. And I was, I mean, prominent people that I know and they were like standing on the cliff. And I, but I saw this, I was like, ooh, they kept it simple. You know, like, like this, we gotta pay for it. So it's like, I, I kind of like saw like, now we, we can get away with having a Vegas wedding at the beach. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. Um, yes. Um, my fiance has been very collaborative. She's, you know, allowed me to give my input. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, yes, she's picking out colors and she's, um, you know, that's her skill. She has an event planning business aside from her wow. career. And so she's wow. like, you know, when she says these are these are calculated conversations. So she's not coming to me saying, hey, I think I might want to. I read something in a magazine. She's like, what about these tables? and these tablecloths, and what about just immediate family, and this, that, and the other, I'm like, hey, that's a great idea. So yes, I'm participating, but she just happens to have very keen insight when it comes to uh, the process because of the you know events that she does. But I am, quiet is kept, looking forward to the simplicity that the pandemic has kind of like, they've made it okay to, like I go to the theater now because I'm a theater guy. So when I go to the theater, I went last night with her. We went to go see Respect, Aretha Franklin. There was five people in the movie theater because everybody's watching it at home now. You know what I mean? And it's it's and 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 we have permission to, I you know, and and I can get out some events now. You know, let Matt invite me to his baby shower. I'm gonna say like, uh, is everybody vaccinated? And um, and really, it's just my way of staying home and watching TV. So, and I'm having fun, bro, but I'm saying like a lot of things changed last year. Now we have permission <laughs> to like stay away from each other. We have permission to send self-tape auditions instead of driving back and forth for a five minute audition and a, you know, $40 worth of gas. I'm having yep. a lot of fun right now, but I am, you know, I'm very sincere about the fact that I like some of the changes and I don't think that in business, we're ever going to go back. Um, I think that Business meetings, it's going to be appropriate to have them over Zoom, even going forward, because we saw that it worked. I think that some of the schools, you know, even whether they be, you know, trade schools or junior colleges, some schools are going to stay online. And, and why not sit in your underwear and do your homework? I mean, that's just me. I know some people miss the social aspect of it. I'm a social person. But a lot of convenience was created last year, even in regards to weddings. No, that's a, that's a great point. And I think that, um, you know, one of the, the nice things is that we can connect on something like Zoom um, and we can still have that personal connection, you know, because I think this is one of the things that we were losing as a society and it could go either way now because of technology. And that is we tended not to... In, in situations where you're social, you tend to listen a little bit less, I think, because you're in a, a whole different environment and music's blaring, you know, someone's got a drink in their hand and they're spouting off stuff. And like, are you really engaged? But here mm. we can't escape it, man. We're, you know, yeah. it's like, okay. You know, if I, if I am, um, you know, just kind of like looking around and stuff. And <laughs> what the fuck am I doing this for that? So, and I think that it does make things simpler too, especially in LA, you know how it is. And, and one of the reasons I loved getting out of there as much as I love this city with all my heart was yeah. 
I, I spent enough time on the 405. Traffic, bro. Boom. Oof. You know, in fact, in fact, I dare to say that you you now could probably sit on the 405, put your phone up, get on Zoom, have that business meeting in the same on the freeway. Yeah. So yeah, you know, it's it's a great point about about simplicity. And I think that's something we kind of lost. And I think that yeah. Yeah, you're right. It gives us that freedom now. So that that's very, very cool perspective to hear. I, and I, I, you know, I'm so glad you guys are, uh, you know, getting a chance to get married. And, and uh, thank you for that, bro. I appreciate that. Absolutely. And final question, you've got, uh, man, you got two, uh, two kids. And uh, they're now hitting that age where you really can't call them kids anymore. Yeah. Has it has it been uh, a difficult what probably last about five, six, seven years where you're going through that whole teenage to 20 year old something process. How, how has that been for you as a dad, not only to see them grow up, but also to see them start thinking for their own and start getting the attitude we all had when we were 17. <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you, Matt, and I swear to God, I'm not trying to, um, you know, be syrupy. Um, I'm not going to imply that it's been perfect, but I have great kids. I have daughters. And I think that as a man, I've been fortunate. Um, we have open communication. Do we have challenges? Absolutely. Uh, are they perfect? No one is. But we've, we have very, we established that from when they were little. Um, you know, I, I, I'll say something for me, it's not crass or crude or inappropriate, but everybody's been raised differently. Like, when, when our daughters were little kids, we decided to use the appropriate terms for everything um, and to like to be honest and clear with them. So I might be giving my daughter a bath when she was two or three, and she might say, and I say, all right, well, I'm, let's say I'm hustling. You know, her mom's at work and I'm, I gotta finish this so I can go do some work. And she's like, daddy, you forgot to wash my vagina. And I'm like, no, don't say that, no! And like, I'm cringing, but at the same time, I got to remember, we taught them that. And she didn't look at it like it was a bad word. It's not. But if right. you grew up in an environment where you didn't use, you know, there's families that don't talk about sex. We talked to both of our children when they turned 12. We got the encyclopedia. We got pictures. We did a whole sexual, um, everything you would get in high school. The, the pictures, the examples, we, we talked about all that. I didn't want there to be any taboo topics in our family. And when they got their period, my oldest daughter came to me and I'm not, again, I'm not bragging. She came to me and she said, hey dad, I think I got my period. And I, she didn't know, but I was shaking on the inside. I was standing there looking very cool, just like uh, Leroy the Pimp and Barry Brewers. I was just like, okay, all right, all right, all right. So um, on the inside, I was like, no! Nah! And I said, well, what, 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 what makes you think that um, you have your period? And she was like, well, there's some blood. I was like, well, it, 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 and then I was dumb, dad. I was like, well, is it a lot of blood or is it just a little? And she was like, I don't know. <laughs> she didn't, I was asking stupid questions because I didn't know what to say. And she was like, I don't know, dad. I said, I said, you know what, I'm sorry. Let's go to Walgreens and we're gonna have your mom meet us there. Why am I sharing this with you? Because now at Tiffany will be 18 next month, Chanel's 20. At 18 and 20, I need Matt to multiply our honesty from when they were toddlers to now. Now we have such great communication that when my youngest daughter told me that she liked a boy, I knew who it was. And she was like, I said, is it the, and I named, I described it because every day I would pick her up from school, they'd be giving each other Google eyes. There's 3,000 <laughs> kids coming out of their high school, but you're, the last couple of weeks, it's just y'all walking and talking. My point in saying that is, I was like, I told my daughter, she said, what do you think? I said, I think he's cute. I, we have a great relationship. I'm not gonna say, ain't nobody ever, not in my house, you ain't gonna be dating nobody. That's natural. Yeah. So yeah. it's been beautiful, man. Like, I think if parents will talk to their kids and more so listen, yeah. if you'll listen, your son, I remember a woman telling me I used to work with kids and we were at an event and all these little kids were running around and she said, Tim, look at the kids. And Matt's over there doing this and he's got his phone out and he's making videos at six. 
and Tim's over there doing this. She said, if you will watch your kids, they'll show you who they are. We spend so much time trying to make Matt, Matt like his dad, who's a mechanic. Matt can't even spell rich. And, and we're trying to make Tim be a doctor. And he's like, I don't, I, I don't like blood. <laughs> Just <laughs> let them become who they were born to be. So with my children, I've tried very hard to do that. And we actually have great communication. So yeah, they have typical teenage, adolescent, young adult challenges, but yeah. nothing like you came in at three o'clock, I'm going to fight you. Like, if you can just establish that when they're young, it'll give yeah. you a firm foundation yeah. for the future. Yeah, and it will also do something. I think um, it, it, a lot of people, it just gets lost on the fact that um, you you want to like them. You, you want to be, you know, you, you don't want to be the friend parent when they're growing up you know you you want to be a parent but when they start hitting 22 23 24 now you have a better idea of who they are and you can have a better relationship yeah. now you can look exactly. at them you know they can respect you as a person you can respect yeah. them as, and you'll still be able to be there for them when something you know a, a bad choice is made a, right. you know or or the happy moments of like oh my god this is wonderful you know you got your first huge job this is amazing you know there's so much there that i think you you're going to be able to cherish more of a relationship with them and eventually that will lead to being a great grandparent as well you know and i yeah, think that, wow. that's good yeah, I think that's a lot of times we, we lose focus of that when we're talking about, you know, having families and what that means, uh, mm -hmm. because everyone has so many different ideas. And, you know, that's wonderful that you can have your own niche. And what works for you guys is great. And, you know, you look at the family next door and what works for them may not be my cup of tea, but it works for them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, as we wrap up, uh, where can uh, people uh, look up what you're doing, follow you on social media, all that good stuff so they know uh, where to, to uh, see all of your upcoming um, announcements and, and kind of get to know you? Absolutely. Uh, on all social media platforms, I am Timothy Teach Jones. The reason why I did that is because my nickname is Teach. I got that years ago. Um, but there's so many Timothy Joneses. My name is so common. It's like Joe Smith. Uh, so Timothy Teach Jones, no different than calling a doctor doc. Um, Timothy Teach Jones on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Snapchat. Uh, you guys can follow me and I can keep you abreast of everything that I'm doing. Again, please download Tubi if you don't already have it. It's a free streaming app. And our, our film came out on Friday. It's called Swim. It star, stars Joy Lawrence. Um, I play handyman Rowan and I would love for you guys to watch it and give us a thumbs up. You know, I think afterwards they ask you to, you know, rate it thumbs up if you like it. If you guys give us a thumbs up, that'll just boost the ratings. And um, I appreciate everybody's support. You know, I'm, I'm aiming for the fence. I do comedy. I do drama. I write. I'm producing a pilot for my own sitcom right now. And I'll start shopping that. I can't be in a position where I'm waiting for someone to call me. Those days right. are over, bro. Like Tyler Perry showed us that you can create the career that you want. Even if you don't like Medea or you don't like his products, you cannot argue with the fact that he's a billionaire and that he owns his own studio and that he no longer needs to come to LA if he doesn't want to, he can shoot everything there. My whole point is maximize your skills and your talents. What can you do? I remember Rev Run saying, start where you are, do what you can and work with what you have. If I shoot a pilot, if I have, you know, me and you and I joked earlier about craft services. Hey, I got water for you. I may not have, um, uh, um, um, you know, uh, Avion and, but, but, you know, I got something. So right. work with, work with what you have, start where you are. Um, and please follow me. I, I'm very big on inspiration. So when you come to my page, I'm not just going to be telling you guys about the great roles that I'm in. I'm going to be trying to encourage you to maximize your potential. 
I think that's a great message. And I, I hope everyone listening and watching, if you're not familiar with Timothy's uh, you know, work, if you haven't seen him on social media, follow him on social media, um, definitely watch the film. Uh, it, you know, Listen, it's free entertainment. That's the other thing. It's free entertainment, which think about that, you know, just on the other side of things like Tubi being invented, you had to have cable. You had to pay a, a fee for a streaming device to see. Now we're able to create content without forcing someone to pay for it, which in turn then gets people to like you more, gets people to be interested in things maybe they've never had the desire to watch. And I think it's very important. And, uh, you know, this is this is what we do. You know, it's it's yeah. it's the fire that burns in us because we want to tell stories and, you know, thank God that we, at least in this short time of this thing called life, get to explore and play and put things out there that might inspire that next generation to be That's better. Than so. Yeah, I love that. And thank you so much, Matt, for having me, man. I know this was, you know, thrown together quickly and you have a lot of people that you could be interviewing but thank you for taking the time to have me on your show, bro. I love what you're doing. And like I said earlier, you just made a connection with a friend. So you're stuck with me now, bro. Oh, appreciate that. And uh, 100% the same way, man. Um, you know, hey, hey, like I look at it, Vegas, L.A., we're, we're, we're so close. Still, that <laughs> thing up, you know? and, that's, and that's what I love. I love the fact that, yeah. man, when you find those people that – you can have conversations like this and just sit down and, you know, Hey man, go, go in the backyard of my house and, you know, have a swim and then sit around and have, you know, some good barbecue and sit down, yeah. you know, Great and talk, conversation. Yeah. Yeah, talk about things and learn from each other. That right. The most, listen, 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 oh. <laughs> listen Linda. <laughs> on that note everyone thank you guys for listening and we'll see you guys next time